Hi. Um, my name is Rory Kennedy. Thank you all for coming here this evening. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I'm a filmmaker, and I made a 10-minute film 12-minute film that you're about to see here tonight. I was part of the presidential's delegation, president's delegation uh, t that went over to Africa about a year ago to look at the crisis of AIDS in Africa, specifically looking at children with AIDS, both children who are affected by AIDS and children who are HIV positive. Um, the White House asked me to join them on this delegation to make a 10 or 12 minute film about the crisis. And really the purpose of this film is to try to humanize the statistics. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of the staggering numbers of people who are infected and affected by AIDS in Africa. And it truly is mind boggling. Um, being, in, being there last year, um, was one of the most profound experiences I've ever had. And um, I hope that we were able to capture some of that in this film that you're about to watch tonight. Um, we have a very full evening, so I don't want to take too much of your time right now introducing it. And it speaks much better than I do about the issues there. But um, look forward to talking to you as the evening goes forward. Thanks. Today, Africa stands on the brink of a new day. Much progress has been made and many more opportunities lie before us. But as we work toward a better and brighter world for our children and our grandchildren, the raging horror of AIDS threatens to leave an entire generation in jeopardy. Each day, lives are being lost, families are being torn apart, and the dreams of our young people are being shattered. Nevertheless, amidst this tragedy, we find hope. Amidst this despair, we see opportunity. The choice is ours to make. Which future will we leave to our children? We are a global family. And as you watch this film, I urge you to open your eyes and your hearts the little ones crying out for help. More than 34 million people currently live with HIV, two-thirds of whom reside in sub-Saharan Africa. As the AIDS epidemic rages across the continent, its effects are felt every day and will be for generations. There are 5,500 AIDS-related funerals in Africa daily, and that number will more than double in the next several years. AIDS, of course, is one of the killer diseases at the moment. It's affecting most of the families. So many lives are lost, including adults as well. I didn't know why he got sick and died, but he got diarrhea. It was a very sudden death. Uh, we tried some medicines, uh, prescriptions from the doctor, but failed.
The, the actual cause of this baby's um, uh, death is a result of HIV. They wouldn't like people to know the cause of the death, particularly in, in, in a case of HIV, because they don't want, you know, they avoid stigmatization. In most instances, it is the parents who are dying and the children who must learn to cope. Bernadette has lost 10 of her 11 adult children to AIDS. Only her youngest daughter has survived. Bernadette is now raising 35 grandchildren. With help from international relief programs, she's begun farming and raising animals. She is now able to send some of her grandchildren to school. Five of her grandchildren have been diagnosed with HIV. Because of the support Bernadette has received, she can now get medical care for the children. There is sores in the mouth. I think it's a, a, a bit of cellulitis. This, this one is a, a positive, infected. Despite the level of devastation, the fight against AIDS has made a difference. In Uganda, HIV rates have been cut by more than half. In the next decade, it is estimated that 40 million children worldwide will be orphaned by AIDS. Without support for extended families and communities, a growing number of orphans are forced onto the streets, leaving social service agencies to mobilize to meet their needs. <laughs> 
This is a drop-in centre for street children. We have about 450 children who come here every day. What we have here is a community school, which means we have eight classes and, and children go to the different classes according to their level. Hurry up! Two, 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 two! And then we have a feeding program, which means that at least the kids on the street can have a meal a day. So they come here and they have a meal. Now we take them food on the street as well. So me, I'm sleeping in the street. If any of these cannot grow up to be a productive adult, then you know that affects the whole the whole country. So we really have to start tackling the problem. I think at the level that the problem is reaching now, if we get the structures and systems into place of how we're going to deal with the problem, I think there's still some way that we can actually solve this problem before it gets out of hand. Across the continent, village by village, there are cost-effective and community-based programs working to help children and families affected by the epidemic. Here we are at Bethesda, which is specifically for children who are HIV positive. We opened our hands, we opened our hearts to accept them. Our children haven't had a right to dream. Our system previously took away their rights to dream. We've got to teach them how to dream again. So it's an awful lot of work to be done. This program is important because it is building self-esteem. You know, it helps people living with HIV and AIDS to have a sense of belonging. You just call on me, brother. These programs are beginning to make a difference, but millions of people remain in need. We have seen the faces of children and families living in a world with AIDS. Their spirit, their determination, and their resilience inspire all of us to join the fight. We are one world, and these children are our children. Their destiny is our destiny. Each of us can make a difference. Each of us can help save lives. Let us wage this holy war together, and for the sake of our children, we will win. Hi, I'm uh, Anthony Appier, I'm chairman of the Committee on African Studies at Harvard, and I have the um, uh, privilege of uh, moderating or 
chairing today's discussion. And what I'm going to do now is just introduce to you the rest of the panel uh, before um, asking uh, each of them to contribute to our discussion. And then we'll open uh, the floor for discussion from uh, you all. There are uh, four mics. And when we get to the time, I'll uh, remind you of that so that you can go to them and uh, participate too. I'm just going to introduce, first of all, the, the panelists. So on my immediate left, uh, left is uh, Dr. Richard Marlink, who's the, uh, been the executive director of the Harvard AIDS Institute since 1992. The Harvard AIDS Institute has the longest standing um, uh, US-based research collaboration uh, in Africa in the field of AIDS, HIV. And he himself has been involved uh, since 1984 in, in work in Africa. Dr. Deborah Zwiedi is the uh, HIV AIDS coordinator and spokesperson for the World Bank and heads the bank's new AIDS campaign for Africa. Uh, before joining the bank in 1994, she was deputy regional director of the Africa region for the AIDS control and prevention project for Family Health International in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Dr. Zwiedi was uh, also, before that, national AIDS control program manager for Ethiopia, uh, where she was born. Um, Bill Harris, uh, next on our panel, founded and continues to head Kids PAC, a political action committee advocating for sound public policies for poor children and AIDS. He was a member of the 1999 presidential mission to Africa on children orphaned by AIDS uh, in Africa uh, with uh, Rory Kennedy. Um, next is uh, Reverend uh, Eugene Rivers who first became engaged in the silent epidemic of AIDS during a trip to Zimbabwe in 1998, um, rather before the crisis became the front page issue that it is now here. During the trip, a Catholic priest who was working with people with AIDS pleaded with him to come back and raise awareness of this crisis here in this country. He's now working with uh, US Af uh, and um, African churches to uh, develop a faith-based response to the uh, orphans crisis. Um, finally, last, but as you saw, by no means least, uh, Rory Kennedy, she's already said she's a social advocate, a filmmaker. She was also on the uh, president's mission. And she co-founded the Africa AIDS Initiative, which is a nonprofit organization in New York uh, dedicated to uh, helping find ways to combat the AIDS crisis in Africa. Now, what, I, what we propose to do is to ask uh, Dr. Marlink, first of all, just to give us a short presentation on the current factual situation, because I think it's, we all agree that it's very important in trying to focus on this issue to have a sense of the basic um, background of the, uh, of the uh, epidemiology, the way the disease is, is currently developing. So, Rick. Thank you, Anthony. I don't know if this, I guess the mic's working. I'm going to stand up so that uh, this is the one professorial time where they'll have some, a few slides. So I apologize. It's good to see some uh, old friends and some new friends in the audience. Um, I think the factual issue uh, Rory presented um, quite well. I don't think we need uh, many more um, statements, the, the, the pictures and images and stories that really uh, will hopefully move us um, here on this side of the ocean um, to do something. I'm going to just try to touch on um, what I'm calling uh, I think a background piece for just a few minutes on the evolution of our, and its ownership here, our epidemics, our HIV epidemics, and it's plural. Um, as a, a medical person who works um, in a virology lab and spends most of my time um, overseas, it's kind of an interesting mix uh, that I could perhaps portray. I'm an expert in none of those fields nowadays, it seems, but I think I can put some perspective on some new uh, findings that uh, historically, as we look back, I think gives us a better idea of perhaps um, why this is so bad now. And um, some of the, I'll just touch on some of the issues that uh, I know the panelists will go into much more depth about. Um, the impact that it's having medically, um, economically, and um, are we going to create a vaccine uh, against this epidemic? This cartoon slide is only put up uh, to really show us that, and to remind us, that this is an epidemic caused by a virus. 
Uh, this is a sexually transmitted virus for the most part worldwide. There are other versions of it as noted um, here in this sort of um, family tree of AIDS-like viruses that are found in primates and were a primate. Um, how many people in the audience have house cats? Can I see? I know there's supposed to be about 40% of the Americans either associate or have house cats, so there's probably a few more hands, but I see them. And probably 40% of you are living with some, uh, uh, some cat that's living with an HIV-like virus or a family. Uh, there's feline immunodeficiency viruses and feline leukemia viruses, which, by the way, we have vaccines against, but they're related to AIDS viruses. They're, these types of viruses are found in um, all of, uh, really throughout many different mammal species, related viruses. The one we're talking about that's gone worldwide um, is HIV-1, shown here. Uh, in the mid-80s to late 80s, we looked at Africa with this sort of uh, seroprevalence, i.e., how common is this virus um, in general populations. And for even low-risk populations, it was quite common then, showing the dark um, black areas, what we call the AIDS belt in Central and East Africa, showing 5% of the general population, um, even in the late 80s, uh, infected with HIV. And in Cote d'Ivoire, also uh, a, a, a terrible problem. Related viruses in West Africa, HIV-2, um, led us to know that um, there's a really maybe different epidemics going on. HIV-1 responsible for the AIDS epidemic worldwide in parallel occurring here uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Um, and HIV-2, really a different virus, a slow AIDS virus, if you will, um, but also in humans, um, led us to know that this is not a unique phenomena and perhaps there's more we need to learn about this virus. Uh, we've now learned more about this virus than any other, uh, perhaps, virus or infectious agent on the planet. Unfortunately, it hasn't translated into curative therapies or a vaccine yet. Even also in the 80s, we knew this is from uh, a book by uh, Jonathan Mann, and Danielle Tarantola, and Tom Netter, AIDS in the World. Um, even then, we knew the uh, global inequity, as it's titled here, which showed the percentage of, this is hard to see because of the um, focus and the small type, but here showing the money in millions of dollars. Again, this is 10 years ago. Uh, or in 1992, but the data then would be 10 years ago, uh, of what goes into AIDS prevention, AIDS care, AIDS research. Um, <clears throat> basically, it's all in the industrialized countries. And AIDS research and et cetera is perhaps 90% in the United States. And the sheer uh, numbers of dollars in developing countries here dwarfed um, by this uh, numbers spent on whether it's care, prevention, or research in the industrialized countries. And the disparity here in the lower part, this represents people and the population either in general terms or in HIV infected terms that's uh, disproportionately in the developing world versus the industrialized world. This disparity is not new. Um, it's amplified now, but it's, it's nicely explained, unfortunately, um, with, uh, we knew about it um, dramatically uh, more than 10 years ago. What we didn't know, and what I'm going to try to introduce tonight quickly, um, is that um, there's also other epidemics, which we call subtypes, going on in the epidemic. And you can see from this slide, which is the percentage of women attending um, birth clinics um, in different parts of Africa in the 80s, the late 80s, we see in 1986 through 1990, we see almost a leveling off in certain areas in that AIDS belt, which unfortunately the leveling off is much higher than we'd see anywhere else in the world. We see 15% of pregnant women uh, in Kilgali, 35% of pregnant women already infected through the 80s. And then we see this curve coming up in 1991 in Francistown, Botswana, just shooting up from less than 5% or really off the, off the uh, map where we, don't, we didn't even think of Botswana before, um, up uh, higher than 
um, Rwanda or higher than any place on the AIDS belt, and that occurring in just two years. I'd been working in Africa since um, 84. I had to admit I didn't even know where Botswana was. And for those of you that go to Africa that, for to see game, it's probably one of the best places to go. I don't go there to see game, and so I didn't really know where it was. I worked a lot in Central and West Africa. It's here in the south, and we see um, just above South Africa, 1982, these um, composite seroprevalence maps showing HIV, again, in general populations that the UN um, AIDS and WHO have put together, showing prevalences starting in 82 of data that's available, probably in, in then Zaire, data is not available, but in Uganda um, and Tanzania, um, already, as we talked about, quite a problem. And then in 87, um, increasing to 2 to 8 percent of the general population across the AIDS belt as we walk through five years later. Um, we see something dramatic happen in 1992, again up to 16 to 32 percent of general population. Uganda really more on the 16 percent side gets the dark red, the sort of dubious dark red category of prevalences and again the AIDS uh, countries that we've talked about through Central and East Africa and some showing up in West Africa. But notice down here now in Central Southern Africa uh, the dubious red prevalence of 16 to uh, 32 percent um, or actually it's more 8 to 16 percent in the, these colors. And we see in 97 what's happened is the red has even gotten darker in Southern Africa. Um, in the countries now most affected worldwide um, are all located in southern Africa. And this prevalence not just includes Uganda, but actually is filled in all the way from the south um, up to the horn, the, the horn of Africa. And some areas we don't have good data or is not uh, are shown in um, gray. But this prevalence, um, just to give you an example, um, Rory touched on, or the film touched on some of the numbers. I think we can touch on the numbers by just um, realizing that this translates into, if we took this prevalence um, for this country, we'd be talking about 35 to 40 million out of our 250 million, 35 to 40 million people infected. We'd be talking about, if I could ask you to just look down your row where you're sitting. You know, in church, sometimes they have you shake the hands of the people next to you or hold hands. <laughs> I'm just asking you to just glance down the row. And one out of every four in your row, uh, one out of every five, perhaps, that's the prevalence we're talking about. Um, I know in, the, in this country, we're talking about in the general population, one out of 300 are infected. So the, the um, difference is... Um, not just tenfold worse, um, but perhaps over twentyfold or more worse. <coughs> and so this dramatic uh, prevalence or increase is really only occurred recently and even dwarfs the epidemic that was already in Africa. This is just a slide to show that same, um, where I showed the slide in pregnant women before in different um, clinics in Africa in the 80s and really bouncing up in the 90s in um, Botswana here in um, orange, really the southern African countries. Here are these five countries, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Swaziland. I um, can't even see what the, that's Mozambique, but it includes Malawi, um, uh, South Africa, Lesotho. Um, a dramatic increase just in the past few years. We don't have to say this, um, it seems cold, but it's really going to translate into um, dramatic um, population differences. These are life expectancies in those seven hardest hit countries, um, pretty much all the southern African countries. And we see the um, coming here into the year 2000, right now we're going to see the dramatic difference in life expectancies where we usually in those countries it might have been 65 years is the average lifespan. Um, this is dropping down to uh, 40 and perhaps even 35 years. Basically, all the advances in life expectancy that have occurred um, in Africa in this past century are being wiped out um, in the next, this last year, this year, and the next uh, uh, handful of years. This is a summary slide. I won't sit on it, but I wanted to just introduce for those of you that are um, um, 
reading a lot about HIV, the idea that this is really different epidemics related to genetic subtypes of HIV-1. There's five major subtypes that we have now appreciated with the with automated um, genetic sequencing, which uh, those of you that are jumping to get into the stock market or the biotech companies, one thing it has given us, the, the sort of new parts of the biotech company, is it automated a lot of molecular biology, whereas um, it would take years to sequence, genetically sequence this virus out, um, stretch it out, its DNA, and sequence it. We can now do that in weeks and sequence the entire viruses, many of them, and actually create a field called molecular epidemiology. And we realized that we're not dealing with the one epidemic here that's subtype B in the United States and Europe that is, um, it started off at least um, associated with uh, homosexual transmission or IV drug use, um, use of contaminated needles or drug pro or blood products. But it really was a single type of subtype, a genetic subtype of this virus in Africa and in India uh, and throughout Asia. We're dealing with multiple subtypes, five major subtypes. And this you can't see perhaps because of the lights, but it just shows the shift in subtypes where now the subtype that I was talking about in southern Africa has shifted to, uh, and it's called subtype C. It now accounts for more infections worldwide than all the other subtypes put together. And that's only within the last few years. So on top of the AIDS epidemic that we've had, there's a uh, sort of a new sweeping through of subtype C, uh, a, a new AIDS epidemic on top of the old um, worldwide epidemic, if you will. Uh, we've already seen the film. Uh, this, is a f this is a shot of a, a, a march um, to a funeral. Um, what's, I think, um, dramatically, hopefully, bringing us here tonight and to do something about this is that the old epidemic uh, has matured. Those people that are um, unfortunately infected in Africa are also now getting, um, many more of them are getting sick. Um, the epidemic that's under the surface is this new epidemic, which actually uh, uh, predicts an even worse situation than what the numbers that the film or that I've talked about um, in, the ne in the coming decade, because we're really dealing um, with an amplification, if you will, of an of a epidemic that's already beyond the numbers we can comprehend here in this country. I wanted to close, if I could, I think it's appropriate here at the Kennedy School of Government and with Rory here, to close with something about um, our country's effort um, to create a vaccine against the epidemic. Vaccine science, as I say here, is a process of trial and error. It's not rocket science. It's um, you take your best guess, and this is not just for HIV, it's for creating vaccines against infectious disease. You take your best guess and you have to test it in humans. Animal models, laboratory experiments can help create that best guess, but eventually you have to bite the bullet, um, test it in large numbers, thousands of us. We're the test animal. And that's the only way to predict if any vaccines are going to work. Um, that takes guts, um, a lot of money, a lot of determination, and a concerted, organized effort like we did for the polio um, epidemic. President Clinton claimed in 1997 that we should um, uh, have a new goal for our science effort, and that is to create a, a vaccine within 10 years, similar to the goal that President Kennedy um, challenged the nation to land a man on the moon within the decade uh, when he talked about that in the early 60s. Um, without the um, leadership and the political will, the finances, and the organization structured like we created NASA to uh, get to the moon, we're not going to reach that goal um, by the year 2007, which is the 10-year period uh, that President Clinton um, challenged us, if you will, um, to create that, um, to create the AIDS vaccine or to have an effective HIV vaccine. At this rate, without um, the structures that we put in place really to go to the moon, um, we're not going to have that vaccine. And that's not just me talking, that's every vaccinologist um, that we've talked to uh, at the Harvard AIDS Institute, and we create uh, vaccine think tanks every six months here at Harvard and bring them here, and it's the same message that we hear over and over again. So our vaccine effort needs to gear up and really bite the bullet and test the vaccines we have. I don't know if that's my time or uh, <laughs> if that's somebody's phone. But test the vaccines we already have on the shelf, uh, and we need the political will and the funding to do that. 
So I'll close there, and that's my summary. Thanks Thank you very, very much. much Dave. Thank you. Um, I thought we'd ask Dr. Zawidi likes to talk uh, in part because she knows as having worked uh, for, for a couple of African governments, in part because now at the World Bank she's involved in thinking about how African governments respond, how to help them respond, and how other governments outside um, Africa can help them respond. I thought I'd ask you if you would just talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Uh, I have worked for an African government, African governments, a bilateral agency, and now the World Bank. Uh, HIV AIDS is a collective global failure. It's not only the failure of African governments, it's every one of us. Um, this is an epidemic which has brought out, if you wish, the inadequacies and the inequalities which existed for a very long time. Uh, African governments have the onus uh, to protect their people. Uh, before I even start talking about the governments, uh, it's very appropriate to mention a couple of things. One, this is not an African epidemic. This is a global epidemic. Uh, what you see in Eastern Europe, in Asia today, is what we saw 10, 15 years ago in Africa. If we don't do what we know works, these continents are going to change to what we see in Africa today. That is where our collective responsibility comes. Uh, African governments, what could they do? What, uh, what was it that they haven't done? They haven't taken this epidemic seriously for a number of reasons. Uh, the nature of the epidemic is something which you cannot see immediately. You, you have a cholera epidemic or you have a flood like we have in Mozambique now, you act immediately. Uh, the people that are uh, dying in Africa today have been infected 10, 15 years ago. And this is something which is very difficult for most African governments to grapple with. Uh, we, the international community, funding agencies, development agencies, have also played our own part in confusing the issues. We go with our priorities and we impose our priorities on African governments. Uh, the, one of the most important things that African governments should have done and should do now is creating an enabling environment for everybody to fight this epidemic. There are NGOs, both indigenous and uh, international. There are religious organizations, civil society, who have tried to do bits and pieces, the kinds of things that you saw in the film earlier. Unfortunately, it's only government that can create an enabling environment for these NGOs, for the religious organizations and the international agencies uh, to move forward. This is what has been lacking so far. Uh, the best example we have is Uganda, which we repeat, which we have been repeating for years. Senegal is another good example. And that's it, we stop there. There are at least 48 countries in sub-Saharan Africa which need to do the same kind of thing that Uganda and uh, Senegal are doing now. The second thing that we have to do collectively, of course, led by African governments, is no country in Africa has a nationwide scaled up prevention program to date. Uh, it's not only prevention, the continent has over 23 million people who are living with this virus. We need to have a scaled up national care program. We don't have that. So these are the kinds of things that uh, is expected out of governments. There is a very important link between HIV AIDS and poverty. Uh, unfortunately for Africa, what this epidemic has done is to attack it from both ends. The cream of the African society the educated people of uh, Africa have been wiped out. If you take Zambia, for example, over 40% of the teachers are infected, an equal number of students. You, ca you can see what that would do to the development of uh, Zambia. On this other end, it's the poor who don't have any access to simple health care. And I'm not even <coughs> talking about the, the uh, antiretroviral drugs, which are out of reach for most African uh, uh, people. So these are the paradoxes that Africa faces today. The good thing, both African governments and the international community are coming together. 
we now have what's known as the new HIV AIDS Initiative for Africa, which has four, five partners, donor governments, the private sector, civil society, both international and national, including people living with HIV, uh, the pharmaceutical companies, all these led by African governments. Uh, we believe that it is only if this epidemic, the effort to this epidemic is led by, this, by the African governments themselves that we will make any dent in this epidemic. So these are some of the, the things that collectively the world is trying to do for the African epidemic. Uh, we have a book in the World Bank, which is our strategy for uh, mitigating this epidemic. The World Bank has declared HIV AIDS <coughs> a development crisis for Africa. This map, we have named it the cost of inaction. In 1982, there was only one country in Africa, Uganda, which had a prevalence rate of about 2% in the general population. 1997, all the 21 countries with a prevalence rate of over 7% in the general po uh, population are all in Africa. And this is what the new partnership is trying to find. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Um, well, Bill Harris, you, you went on the presidential mission to Africa, and uh, I guess it'd be appropriate for you to talk a little bit about what you learned and also uh, what's happening now and what you think uh, we should be doing, including uh, through our government in the United States. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks to Harvard for putting this on and for the groups who organized it. This is a subject that's critical and lends itself to much more than one single night. We're not going to solve this this evening. Uh, the president sent the mission to uh, three countries in sub-Saharan Africa, Zambia, South Africa, and Uganda about a year ago. There were two specific goals. First was to learn more about the pandemic and how specifically it affected children, the 40 million children who will have lost a, a parent to AIDS by the year 2010, and to see if anything can be done, if anything was being done. Uh, it's important when we talk about these horrific numbers to remember Rory's uh, beautiful documentary and that we're talking about human beings. It's so easy to lapse into the 40 million or the 100 million people who will have been infected by HIV by the year 2005, and we keep forgetting that these are actually babies and moms and dads and sisters and brothers and grandparents. We saw many places where money, a small amount of money was put to work. They were helping in areas such as public education. There was com community support mechanisms such as microcredit. The grandmother uh, that you saw in the film uh, is part of a microcredit program uh, that is funded partially by USAID uh, that allows a collective of women to help each other borrow small amounts of money so that they can get the pigs, get the coffee beans, make the banana beer, uh, and be able to get some of those kids uniforms and get those kids into schools. Uh, we saw agricultural assistance programs. We saw very little mother-to-child transmission trials going on even as the science continues to explode, where we can, in fact, uh, I want to be careful saying this in front of the doctor, reduce uh, uh, transmission of an HIV-positive mom to the newborn through vaginal delivery by up to 46% for something under five bucks. Uh, and that's not going on. We're not doing that. Uh, we saw that there were ways that we believed money could be spent and resources should be allocated. And so we came back and we went up to Capitol Hill. And I can assure you that most people who thought when we went to Capitol Hill about a year and a quarter ago that we were nuts. Hmm. Uh, hmm. And, and they were wrong. Uh, there, in fact, is uh, an interesting goodwill and an interesting and growing understanding about why this is in our interest. Uh, when we went on the first trip, which was an advanced trip before the mission, we had a reporter uh, from a newspaper whose editor said, why should anybody in America care about Africa? And you're not gonna get much space in the paper if you can't somehow say that people in America do. Well, we actually did a poll 
about a year ago, uh, before any of this stuff was in the news very much. And we found out that fully two-thirds of the people in the poll of registered voters viewed it as a serious problem. And interestingly, something that we could not explain and still have not, three-quarters of the people in the American uh, registered voters thought that the AIDS epidemic in Africa would have an effect on people in the United States. So, of course, the first thing we did, knowing that you're talking to political people with this, is you've got to figure out whether you're nuts. We went to another pollster, another crazy pollster, who essentially replicated them a few months later. And I would say that this was before uh, Rory's film, uh, which has had wonderful airings and has had an enormous the positive impact on Capitol Hill and elsewhere, uh, and before a lot of media play, before World AIDS Day things, and certainly before Vice President Gore and uh, Ambassador Holbrook went to the UN on January 10th of this year uh, to present the issue. The issue does register, and the polling data suggested that you could show to people in politics and on the Hill that American people uh, cared. Interestingly, we oversampled in a couple of the questions uh, African-American voters uh, in America, and it was very, very slight differences between the responses between African-American voters and other voters on the same positive scales. So the question really was, if we got people involved in the Hill, why would they care? There's the first and obvious answer that each of us might come up with, which is it's a moral issue. And indeed, Minority Leader Gephardt, who just uh, took a bipartisan uh, delegation there uh, to uh, Uganda and South Africa and plus or minus another couple of, all these countries are not the same. When we speak about Africa, I'm only speaking about four or five countries that I went to. Each is different with its own culture. But anyway, Gephardt went over there, came back, and has said to people, ranging the, from the president to the media and his colleagues on both sides of the aisle, that this is the most important moral crisis of our time. There's simply no way to examine this issue and to understand what it is and what it will mean for all of us, our children, and yes, for you students, for your children and your grandchildren as it's coming around. Another issue which was touched on, which I won't have time to discuss, is the development issue. Uh, Rick mentioned the question about the reversal of the life expectancy uh, that's also connected with the increase in infant mortality. It's also increased with the uh, lower per capita GDP in some of these uh, uh, countries where there's already uh, quite a bit of poverty. Uh, and the costs of business are going up and the profits are going down. Uh, one of the growth industries is the coffin business. When you come into Kampala in Uganda, you pass a whole strip where they're coffin makers. And in fact, you, you, uh, th there are some now some environmental issues because of the uh, free cutting of timber for making coffins. The biggest surprise we encountered, and we were very lucky to do so, and I think, and this is a personal opinion, not speaking for anybody else, was that, that the, uh, while everybody was interested in 40 million orphans and kids, and somebody can come up with a moral issue and some kind of an economic issue. The driver behind the United States congressional interest, and, and I believe a lot of the administration interest, is national security. Who in the world, all you Kennedy people here, thinking about national security in terms of poor babies and poor women and thinking, where in the world does that connect? It turns out that I'm sure there's some people who knew a lot more about this in this room, about national security. But national security people don't like instability, <laughs> and, uh, which not to suggest the rest of us do. But the uh, instability is a particular pain when you've got economic GDP going down, when you've got infection rates in sub-Saharan African militaries uh, going from 20%, reported 20% infection rates, up to over 50 to 60%. National security people don't like that. But why they also don't like that there's much worse on the horizon. And I think uh, Dr. Zudi just, uh, just began to talk about this. Uh, the national intelligence estimates suggest that in Asia by 2010, that the, uh, and, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that the, uh, the numbers in Asia of HIV infections, <coughs> excuse me, could surpass Africa by 2010. Probably not now with subtype C. 
But so it's they could they then have possibly a, exceed the old If you include India, pandemic. that's subtype. If you include India. Yeah. It's okay, okay. It's bad. It's bad. <laughs> and India's got more nuclear bombs that they're talking about than some of the places we visited in Africa. Furthermore, the former Soviet Union, just in Russia alone, it looks like we're going to exceed 1 million infections by the, year, by the end of this year, which could double again by 2002. And this also is a place with nuclear weapons. Uh, the national security people are extraordinarily interested in this subject. And I believe that that's been brought together in a way combining with the moral issues and the just basic right and wrong issues uh, that's helped on the Hill. Uh, we've come some distance. Uh, about two years ago, the increase that was sent up to the Congress for dealing with global AIDS was less than $10 million. Uh, on July 19th of last year, uh, Vice President Gore uh, stood up and asked for an additional $100 million for the global AIDS effort, and the Congress gave it to him without, without squawking. Uh, on January 10th, Vice President Gore went uh, back to the Security Council with Ambassador Holbrook and asked for another $100 million above that, as well as the potential for $50 million for vaccine research. There are now around eight to 10 pieces of legislation that have been introduced, kicking around in hearings in Washington that are underway right now. The media activity is increasing. Uh, I'm more than cognizant of what $100 million is and $200 million. It's basically more than you can get from a grant from the Institute of Politics mm -hmm. and substantially less than we need to take a very serious crack at this uh, pandemic. Uh, I'm hopeful that there'll be additional leadership that will come forth in Sub-Saharan Africa. Unfortunately, the leadership has been quite slow in terms of getting out and dealing with Sigma, the stigma issues. Uh, while HIV and AIDS is an equal opportunity killer, it's not at all equal in, uh, in terms of how it affects race and gender. The racial and gender inequalities uh, by this disease are incomprehensibly difficult. Uh, I think that each person in this room can make an enormous difference by getting involved. We need to merge the political part of the school with the other parts of the school because people have to be able to talk with one another to go out and get the resources. Uh, there's much, much more to do. I do not believe 200 or $250 million is a success for dealing with this pandemic and the numbers of people. A friend of mine said, when we just left last, uh, this January, he was looking at, he was playing with some kids actually, uh, out of, about two hours out of Kampala. He said, imagine growing up here with war and famine and then getting hit with a plague and then who's gonna be taking care of these children? And I think it's everybody in this room, along with everybody in a lot of rooms, they're gonna to have to address that. Thank you. Uh, Gene, do you wanna continue with the issue of what we can do? And yeah, I'd, um, I'd like to talk about some ideas revolving around what we can do and attempt to connect those ideas to the current political context. Uh, there is a way that the AIDS in Africa, epi ep the AIDS in Africa uh, epidemic can descend into humanitarian discourse with a, a recycled run of bloated babies, pitiful, pitiful looking Africans, reach out across the world concerts, and a whole public relations industry, which will not address some more fundamental political questions that revolve around this issue. So to avoid the, the, the cottage industries of pitiful Africans, uh, which plays into some of our noblest liberal instincts, we should, if we're to be honest, address the political and social context within which issues of development policy and foreign policy should be, you know, dominant. You see, 150 million, 100 million for a sub-Saharan African continent 
a billion for Colombia for a drug war. One country, one country, a billion dollars. Countless numbers of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we're talking about 150 million. Now, I would not suggest that the two billion annually for Israel, which is important to the U.S.'s national interests, security interests, two billion for one nation, one very small nation, and 150 to 200 million for an entire sub-Saharan continent. Well, that's not quite rational or just. So if we're going to have more than a tear-jerking, mystical, romantic discussion where we play to our paternalistic impulses to feel sorry for poor black people who are pathetic and hopeless, we should elevate this beyond humanitarian and moralistic rhetoric to a real nuts and bolts discussion about the dollars and cents involved. I was at the United Nations when Vice President Gore made the noble gesture of saying we'll commit 150 million more. But one billion for Colombia's drug war? When we've got 22 million people who are being reduced to a biological underclass and whose circumstance would qualify by any rational definition as a holocaust, since they are humans. Additionally, we should elevate this beyond the liberal feel-good to a real politic analysis of what the worst case scenario is. Because unless we don't have a serious, rigorous examination of the, the domestic political economy which drives the drug industries, who are perfectly willing to let black people die in Africa to increase their profit margin. We're looking at a context in which there's the real possibility, given how bad the numbers are, as Richard said, the re we're looking at the real possibility of the recolonization of Africa as they let the Holocaust rip, substituting warm feelings for pathetic little Africans for a real detailed analysis of the political economy of the drug industry and how they're influencing the entire political discourse. So part of, Anthony, to move to your issue of what we can do is elevate the quality of political and intellectual discourse so that we really interrogate the bottom lines that drive where the United States is. This is, you know, God bless the first black president of the United States, Bill Clinton. <laughs> but, but, Rwanda, Rwanda, where people died un needlessly. Sierra Leone, okay, come on somebody. Sierra Leone, and now a sub-Saharan continent, which is being reduced to a biological underclass, and they throw less than crumbs, less than crumbs, to millions of people. So my practical suggestion is, that we should engage in a more theoretically and politically rigorous interrogation of the real economic factors that drive this discussion, lifting it out of the paternalistic, let's help the natives feel good ideology to a real push around the values and interests that drive US foreign policy, which has, not, which has been at best incoherent during this current administration, and it accounts for Rwanda and Sierra Leone, and the fact that, you know, you know, crumbs are being given to Sub-Saharan Africa while people are fully aware of the fact that we're looking at 40 million orphans. I suggest further on the practical side that in this country, the black faith community mount an ideologically independent campaign to push the issue of the, the rationality, the politics, and the morality of US foreign policy in Africa and that we not let any group or organization duck and dodge the issue of the politics and the economics, which is how we talk about these issues when we're dealing with humans. We talk about nuts and bolts, we talk about bottom lines, and we talk about measurable outcomes. Same thing here. The black community has been, in this country, has failed to step up to the plate. Our leadership from the special envoy to Africa, who has not done what he could have done on this issue, to the rest of the black political leadership class. So let's push the debate, let's force the issue, let's challenge the Clinton administration. The black community needs to convene practically a, 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 a town meeting 
on presidential leadership and U.S. foreign policy in Africa with a focus on the AIDS epidemic and get uh, Gore and Bush at the table to document what they're going to do on this issue. And that's elevated. You see, because what we haven't talked about, last point, are two issues. One, there's a racial logic to this. Is it a mystery that there are no adequate resources being given to the Africans as opposed to what they might do in Kosovo and Bosnia? Is that a mystery? And if we're going to be honest, should we not put that on the table and keep it real? All right. Additionally, on the African side, when I went to Harare, I was there to mind my business, spend time with my wife and kids, and do my kente cloth, kick it up and relax in the motherland trip. <laughs> However, I was confronted by a Catholic priest who said, look here, Rivers, they are going to let this AIDS epidemic rip so the white boys can get the beachfront property back. In the worst case scenario, you must mobilize a campaign that transcends the humanitarian rhetoric of high liberalism, which dearly doesn't view Africans as equals, and force the issue around behavior. Because we haven't talked about this. I'm going to put this last point out. The AIDS epidemic, the AIDS sexual holocaust is heterosexually driven. Men are raping girls. And this, the, the sexual promiscuity or behavior if you're a high liberal, is producing a crisis, and we are, it doesn't make any difference. If you had the vaccine tomorrow, if men do not correct their behavior with regards to women, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make a difference. If we have a vaccine 10 years from now, if African leadership and black leadership are not willing to raise the issue of, of, of morally responsible behavior on the part of men, African, uh, with regards to women, all of the feel-good, touchy-feely, reach out across America, rhetoric around saving the pitiful Africans is not going to make a bit of difference. So let's put the issue of behavior, promiscuity, norms, and sexual conduct on the table, and not as good liberals duck and dodge the issue of personal responsibility. Thank you. Rory, I know you want to talk uh, as well about how to get people involved, and maybe we could um, ask you to lead us into the discussion with the audience here by talking about some ways that you have in mind that people could actually um, come away feeling that there's something that they can do. OK. Well, I'm really glad you put me after the reference. <laughs> it's a bit of a challenge. God bless you. Lord bless your heart. Hey. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people here on the panel have talked about different strategies. And obviously, what you have said has been very helpful in setting out the numbers and the statistics. And um, you've talked about the World Bank and, and the international community's involvement. Bill has talked very articulately about the importance of the government getting involved. And obviously, you've touched on a lot of very deep, very profound issues. And I think the great thing is that none of these strategies are mutually exclusive. Right. Um, and how I've approached this issue is as a filmmaker and as a documentarian, um, trying to, as I had said in introducing the film, really trying to humanize this issue and bring it into the realm in this country so that it is no longer just about statistics, but it's about people just like you and me who happen to live on a different continent, but who are facing very real issues of life and death. And um, through this film, I am trying to bring that issue to people here, to people on Capitol Hill. And, um, but our strategy isn't just to make a film for people to watch passively. And I've actually co-founded an organization after coming back from Africa and having this experience called the African AIDS Initiative with Ochoa Otuno and Dr. Roshan. Ochoa is in the audience here today. And the idea behind the organization is let's do something with this film. And let's do something with this issue. Let's not just have it shown in one or two places, but really use it as a proactive tool. Um, so in terms of you know, how people here could get involved, I would encourage you to, there's, there was a leaflet handed out called the Africa AIDS Initiative. I hope that many of you got this. Um, I would encourage you to contact us. And if you're interested working with us to, to get the film out, to show this to people, it has made an enormous impact. Um, 
It's when I was with Bill, actually, on Capitol Hill, and Senator Leahy was there, and after watching the film, he said, I want you to know I put an extra $25 million in the budget, and it's because of this film. So it is having an impact, and, and our goal really is to try to get it out there as much as possible. Um, in addition to that, we are working with colleges across the country with um, connecting them with orphans in Africa. And we're asking some colleges to adopt orphans and work with them to give them support, not only financial support, but sending them books. Um, and working with them with their specific needs. And we've talked to Harvard about you all being involved in that capacity. If anybody is in particularly interested, we'd love to talk to you. And again, I would encourage you to get in touch with us. Um, so, you know, I think that there, there are a lot of grassroots efforts that can happen in this country through this college um, and university so that you all take a real proactive role in this as well. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I think one minute, and then I want to let. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, what I thought I'd like to do now is just invite you. I mean, this is meant to be a chance to introduce a discussion, um, and that includes you. So there are these four mics. There are two here. I'm not quite sure where the other two are, but there are two up top as well. And if you could just go, if you want to have something to say, if you'd just like to go and stand at one of the mics, I'm just going to try and go around the mics in order. I would ask you. Uh, if you would, to um, try and be relatively brief. And also, if possible, if to move the, the discussion along, if you would uh, maybe aim a question, perhaps uh, even at some specific person, uh, that, that would uh, help us very much indeed. Um, the hard part of my job is that uh, is only going to be uh, necessary if that doesn't happen. I will cut people off eventually. Uh, because I do want to, I do think it's important that we give uh, a range of people a chance to speak. But uh, let's start here and uh, first speaker. Maybe you could say well, your name when you when you introduce yourself to us. Uh, my name is Kamal Latham. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, first, I want to thank Reverend Rivers for bringing up the point of the racial issues because I think if AIDS has been ripping through Western Europe or Israel, we'd see a very different response coming from the United States. My question is for Mr. Harris. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about Vice President Gore and, and what he has done to sort of try to get funding. Now, it's very easy to get up in front of the United Nations and say we need to pledge a few more dollars uh, for AIDS in Africa. However, when it came down to dealing with the pharmaceutical companies, he totally yielded to them and the entire Clinton administration because when it came down to dollars and cents, and the pharmaceutical company said that we were concerned about giving the rights to African nations and putting the, the AZT drug cocktail there because and they may drop it on the black market, et cetera, et cetera, and they yielded to that. Now, what I'd like to know from you is what does the Clinton administration think about that position that has been taken, and is the Clinton administration prepared to take on the pharmaceutical companies to ensure that the cocktail will be able to get to those who need it? <laughs> before, before Bill Harris re Wait, replies to that very direct question, I should like to say that we didn't invite him here as a representative of the Clinton administration. And he, he, uh, 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 while I'm sure he has something to say on this topic, um, I, I, the cough is not in response. To the <laughs> or, or, or any of the panelists have any ideas yes. of how well, average citizens like yeah. me could influence the Clinton yeah. administration yeah. to do Good. that. Good. Well, I'd love to respond. Number one is I am not a member of the administration. Uh, I'm a, what a friend of mine in Zambia calls a non-governmental individual. <laughs> uh, the issue on the pharmaceutical, there's not a quick answer to your pharmaceutical issue. What happened uh, uh, when Gore announced in Carthage, the day he announced, a group called ACT UP demonstrated at the announcement against the United States policy on uh, trying to make the, uh, the drugs available for South Africa to manufacture, which is part of the WTO, as you understand, the World Trade Organization Agreement. Because of their participation, because of their activity, and because of the media follow-up, I believe, as an individual, that the administration actually rethought how it was going to deal and went back to South Africa and changed the nature of those discussions so that now it is, still, it is now possible for South Africa to buy the cheapest 
available, number one, and number two can actually do the uh, manufacturing. It's still very, very complicated. I don't want to gloss it over. You're right on the subject in terms of bringing it up. There is, however, I think, a, there are a number of people, including myself, who think before we start thinking about bringing retrovirals and everything else over to any place where these numbers exist, there would be a good idea to begin with penicillin and aspirin and be able to have a couple of roads and a couple of vehicles to get the uh, palliative medicine into the communities. That is not to suggest in any way, shape, or form a biological underclass or an unequal treatment. It is, in fact, to address the reality that we face as citizens of the world. It's called triage. Mm. And we have to help some people now. We cannot be waiting around for getting retrovirals out into that grandmother's house, which is two and a half hours outside of Kampala, when we can't get oxygen in Kampala. OK, but let's, let's push that. So if that's the case, and I agree with that, we cannot let the Clinton go administration, who say they are friends to everybody, Send one billion dollars to Colombia to fight a drug war, they will never win. And then you, you know, and then ignore. With, I mean, I mean, where's the billion to to, to produce the palliatives uh, 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 that you refer to <laughs> don't, don't, for the Africans? Don't wait a minute. Don't knock the palliatives. That takes not, care no, of my, people's no, no, pain. No, no, no. I understand that. My point. No, that's precisely my point. That we have got to force a new political discussion in this country, which is bipartisan, because you send a billion dollars to the Colombians to play around with new toys and, and you know weapons contracts to blow things up, and then in sub-Saharan Africa, qua Africa. You can't, $150 million. We should not let that kind of hypocrisy stand. Then I think what you should do is organize and deal oh, with Oh, we're going to do that. Absolutely. We're going to organize the churches. And <laughs> oh, they're going to fight against Jesus and the kids. Oh, absolutely. And, oh, deal, oh, absolutely. and deal with the complicated issues of intellectual property and the pharmacy. That's that complicated. No, no, no. That, that's, that's a ruse. That's a ruse. It's not intellectually complicated. It's a politically complicated issue because we're talking about pharmaceutical monopolies. So let's not hide behind the fig leaf of intellectual complication. It's not that deep. This is not nuclear physics. What they can do is surrender the price and make it accessible to human beings because they're human beings. And these folk are made in the image of God. So no, no, it ain't nothing that complicated. I'm all with you. Go get the government. Oh, oh, oh absolutely. Okay. But it's Thank not complicated. Let's not Thank play you. that obfuscation game. Hi. I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm sorry. My name is Lisa Bobo. I'm a family nurse practitioner. I work in immigrant health. And a couple of the panelists had mentioned that there were some prevention programs that had worked in Senegal and in Uganda. Um, what kind of programs are working in Africa? Are they similar to the ones that we use here in terms of talking about prevention, education, access to condom, access to um, <coughs> clean needles, although I know that that's not the primary mode of transmission, just what, what sort of programs are working there? I mean, go ahead, I mean. Well, uh, they are more or less the same uh, as you mentioned here. The problem is the scale issue. Uh, let's take condoms, for example. The best example we have in Uganda for distribution and proper usage is about 60%. So if you go to the rural areas in Uganda, there, people will be there looking for it, but it doesn't exist. Uh, most of the effort at the beginning of the epidemic has been on uh, awareness. The awareness level in most of the African countries is approaching 90, 98% now. What we have not been able to do, <clears throat> which comes back to the antiretrovirals earlier on, is we have not been able to back up the awareness with the tools for people to, pre to prevent infection. We don't have enough condoms. We don't have drugs for opportunistic infections, which would cost only about 50 US cents. So there are a lot of this. But the major problem we have is over 90% of Africans don't even know they are infected. We don't have the counseling and testing system in place. So when you, when you take it to the higher level of making drugs accessible, we need to build the infrastructure which would enable us to administer these drugs. So there are stages of doing these things. Again, to, to reinforce the question earlier, what can you do? You sit in a very important position where you can bring the advocacy at a very high level. Right. We can deal, we the technicians can deal on the ground to do the prevention, but the political agenda has to 
be in a very, very different level. And that is what you can contribute. Rick? I one sort of a comment before, uh, and I, I'm not as eloquent on the podium as the reverend, but um, I, I think he would, I think maybe we all agree is that we do have some things in common and what you're asking what works. And in Senegal I know intimately and, and Uganda through friends, um, but what has worked in people, what motivates people to, to change. Um, if we're not leaders ourselves, and I don't mean necessarily political leaders, leaders meaning you take the path that's different and you actually lead, um, it's, it really depends on leaders or on following leaders. So leaders have to be involved um, or become a leader yourself. And so programs or countries or settings that where leaders are involved. And we also are motivated by what our peers are doing and what affects us personally. So I think those three things are where programs that work. And um, in Uganda, what's worked is, unfortunately, as I showed on the map, the epidemic's been there, matured, leveled off, is worsening and uh, in other areas of Uganda. So it's where family members have died, um, friends have died, loved ones have died. Um, so it's leaders getting involved, um, peer, peer to peer, uh, motivation, and then unfortunately the worst peer motivation is uh, where uh, people have, are affected and die. On, on that, at the UN meeting to which Bill referred, uh, where Vice President Gordon Holbrook talked about their initiative, one of the things that was cited by a number of women from Namibia uh, and from uh, women in Zimbabwe, there is a revolutionary concept which is now being introduced in many of these African countries, it's called abstinence or monogamy or condoms. And so one of the things that's going to have to be confronted, and this is very difficult, frankly, to talk about in the West because most Westerners are very worried about being called racist or what have you, the issue of abstinence and monogamy, especially for children. When 70% of the high school seniors in Zimbabwe are HIV infected, 70%. Then we've got, to deal, we've got to deal with some behavioral issues. So the, the, the politically difficult issue to put on the table, which is now unavoidable given the numbers, is how do we address behavior and talk about it in ways that aren't stupid or PC, but ensure that these folk will stay alive biologically? Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Sinead Walsh. I'm a senior here at the college. Um, before I ask my question, I just wanted to let you know that there are two Harvard student groups that work um, with AIDS projects abroad. One is an organization called IMPACT, and we work with um, an AIDS project in Mali called Kenegadu Solidarity. I actually just so happen to have flyers, and I'll leave them out at the table. Um, and, and Kennedy School students might be interested to know that there is a graduate wing of the organization as well. So that's a way you can help. Um, the other organization is called Visions, and we're actually joining together to have a fundraiser in April. So anybody who um, contacts us from the flyers, please, please look out for that. Um, my question is for Dr. Marlink. I vaguely know of a study that was done last year, I think it was in Nairobi, on 60 sex workers, and it was found that many of these women had a natural immunity to being HIV, or at least in advancing to seropositivity that was found to be genetic and it was something to do with their having naturally more protective T cells. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I think it's almost a side issue, but it's, there is a, 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 a gene change that's been identified that may um, have a less propensity for getting infected. It's not a, a magic bullet. Um, and uh, it doesn't explain um, all the results in Nairobi. Um, but when they found the literally saturation points uh, that would have been predicted mathematically and over the years by the sheer number of sexual partners in a cohort of prostitutes, it didn't make sense that it uh, leveled off and, and a small minority never seemed to get infected even though they were still repeatedly exposed. But um, genetically, it's almost a side issue in terms of uh, finding a magic bullet or having it be totally protective. But I would like to applaud, the, again, the, another examples of things people can do is getting involved in, whether it's the student groups here, um, 
for those of us here at the Harvard AIDS Institute, if we know the two groups you identified, but if we could find out about um, any other Harvard efforts or Boston efforts, it's yeah. not, um, uh, just so we know, because we've got tons of calls of uh, being the Harvard's Institute on AIDS uh, as to where to send people. Our own research or outreach in terms of improving care in the countries we're involved with, um, we'd love to have more people involved, um, which include um, Senegal, Botswana, South Africa, Tanzania, um, Kenya, uh, Ethiopia, I know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so any of those issues, I think you really have to go there, be involved, and you'll, uh, as Rory says, you'll never be the same again. My name is Adam Taylor. I'm a first year student at the Kennedy School. I'd like to thank all the panelists for joining us this evening. I agree with many of the panelists who have made a very strong argument that the $250 million that the U.S. government, Clinton and Gore, has allocate on this issue represents a very anemic and negligent amount of money. It's, it's shameful that it's that small. And I agree with Reverend Rivers that it's through mobilizing people through their vote and through political organizing that that type of change is going to take place. But I'm also a little fearful and wary of simply relying on the government to respond to this issue. And I'm wondering, from the panel's perspective, how can we translate people's concern about this crisis, particularly their initial concern, into something that's much more tangible in terms of financial contribution and whether a mechanism can be, can be made, whether people are giving money for humanitarian reasons, out of guilt, whatever their motivations, the bottom line is that money is required in order to fund a lot of struggling and impoverished governments in Africa to do very substantive AIDS prevention work, particularly in terms of caring for orphans. And so I'm wondering, what can we do to really encourage and force businesses churches, civic organizations, yeah. to really come forward in a very forceful way on this issue? One, I want to thank Harvard uh, and all the folk that put this panel together for creating a, another venue, an opportunity to sort of publicize the issue. There have to be secular organizations, student groups, uh, the faith community have to now undertake a major educational campaign to publicize the issues from all of the angles that have been outlined and then develop strategic partnerships uh, in Africa, I, uh, we're talking with a number of church groups around the country that actually want to assist in providing financial and material support to build orphanages with a 20-year a projection. If we're looking at 40 million orphans, over, you know, you would need 80,000 mission schools at 500 kids a pop over the next 20 years mm -hmm. to address the needs of this, 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 the, you know, this orphan population. So more public education, developing kind of uh, uh, bilateral connections with organizations that are already doing work, uh, working with NGOs in Africa. So there's a whole grassroots movement that has to emerge, which is non-governmental by intention, because you get caught up in all the cuckoo politics at the top. And those kinds of initiatives have to be launched. Um, I'm just going to interrupt the flow a little bit here, just for a moment, to ask Rory if she has anything that she'd like to say before she has to go and catch her flight. We're going to go on for a little bit longer, okay. but I, don't, I didn't want to, since she did us the uh, favor of coming here, I didn't want to hold her in, um, beyond the time. I know you have oh, to leave at 8.30. Thank you. I'm, I am sorry that I have to um, head back to New York, but um, I, you know, I guess I, I would just add one other point to that, which is that I think it's really easy to get overwhelmed by the sheer numbers um, associated with this epidemic, and it is awesome um, and, and really overwhelming. And I think that we all have to feel, and it is in fact true, that any small contribution that we make does make a big difference. Um, and especially you know, in places that we went to in Africa, on $12, people could get medication and send their children to school. I mean, it, you know, the smallest contribution makes an enormous impact. And I think it's really important that in any way that everybody here can get involved, that they do. I want to thank Rory Kennedy very much. As I say, we're going to go thank on. Thank you. You don't stop now, but just. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the film. Thank you for having me. It was a real honor to be here. Can I just okay. respond to that? Absolutely. Uh, Gentlemen, Mr. Taylor. Yeah. I think one of the questions that people are beginning to face now uh, reminds me a little bit of a few, couple of decades ago about taking money from the cigarette companies and from the liquor companies. 
because certainly some of the new money that is coming into the system and that will be coming forward to work on all kinds of very important things from research in the lab to research on the ground yeah. and service delivery will be coming from the pharmaceutical companies. I think it's important to understand that. Uh, it's always good to understand the stripes on the tiger when you're getting ready to do battle. One, just one additional point on Adam's question. Um, one of the things that uh, has emerged out of the work that we did uh, beginning with the churches in uh, December of uh, 98 is that there is a Pan-African Congress of churches that want to develop bilateral relationships with churches in Africa to develop strategic partnerships with the IMF, the World Bank, and USAID to mobilize resources. Uh, the the, the, the community of African descent in the United States has much more influence than it realizes or uses. And so we want to use what potential influence that we have to impact upon U.S. foreign and, and development policy. So one of the things that can happen is that the faith communities have to get on the dime and mobilize themselves more efficiently, not complain about what other folk ain't doing, but sort of pick up the lip and get involved in producing some measurable outcomes. Okay. Additionally, for students, uh, there's a forum that co-sponsored this called the 21st Century Group, uh, based in Boston here, and they have uh, sponsored two fora, uh, one in May and then one in December, that you know, sort of help lead up to where we are today. And so they're here locally, and any of you young people that are interested in uh, doing some real work, focused on some measurable outcomes, please feel free to contact them. They're around here somewhere. Excellent. Okay, ma'am. Hi, good evening. My name is Wamboi Githiara Updike, and I'm from Kenya and living in Cambridge currently. And I just returned from man's visit from Kenya, and I was very astounded by the silence surrounding the question. And even though the AIDS, um, um, the Kenya NGO partnership, and so many other private and family groups are doing a lot, I'm, I'm concerned about the political will and leadership that Dr. Zayodi mentioned, and others have mentioned as well. But does the bank or any of you have any specific thoughts on how do you mobilize, for example, this government? Do you have any, is the new AIDS initiative with the bank specifically talking about this at the policy level and just mobilizing a conversation? We need a national conversation about AIDS in Kenya and in all these other countries. Do you have any? Yes. I, uh, I just came back from <laughs> Kenya on Saturday. <laughs> Uh, last July, the Kenyan government had a cabinet change, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And what we did, by we I mean the bank and the UNAIDS partners, these are seven agencies that make up UNAIDS, uh, went to Kenya and addressed each and every one of the cabinet members. And what we tried to impress upon them was whatever they are doing and whichever side of the government they are on, mm -hmm the development of Kenya and the future of Kenya is being wiped out. Uh, there is something which, with due respect to the reverend, Kenya is one of the countries where religious groups have uh, negatively contributed yeah. towards the spread of this epidemic. Definitely. That right. is one country that uh, I know in the world which has a ritual of burning condoms on the streets yeah. for, for a number of um, biased reasons. In any yeah. case, what happened between July and last week was we requested a number of things from the Kenyan government. Uh, one, to admit to break this conspiracy of silence. Uh, there is infection rate in Kenya varies anywhere from 80% in commercial sex workers to 10% uh, in the general population. Uh, to our surprise, the Kenyan government has taken this upon itself. Uh, and the reason why I was in Kenya last week was they have formed a council which has government interministerial council. Every single ministry is, is represented, religious leaders, traditional leaders, women's groups, people living with HIV. They have drawn a strategy as to how to move forward, and they have been calling on the international community. We have done what you told us to do and here we are, come and help us. There is something which is very, very substantive. Uh, President Moy had never, ever said a word about HIV. It's 
forget about condoms. We never thought that he would uh, say the word condoms. Mm -hmm. He had declared HIV AIDS as an emergency for Kenya, and they are dealing with it on an emergency basis, just like war. Um, two, he had come out and he had said, people should abstain. People should have one sexual partner, all these nice things. But people should have access to condoms and they should use them. This coming from an African head of state, that is tremendous. So hopefully, we are seeing more of these kinds of things in Africa. And uh, I have every reason to believe that we will move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to say something? I think combining what you just said about Kenya, where we just were also, and what Reverend Rivers was saying is that we have to move and I think each of us knows yeah. that, yeah. from waging skirmishes against this disease right. to Absolutely. waging war. Absolutely. Nobody is questioning that we're waging skirmishes. Right. But the question of mobilizing the political will and the resources right. to get out there has not been fully addressed, and it certainly hasn't been answered yet. Right. I agree. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, I think it's... Uh, it's Would you mind just telling us your name? Oh, my name is Neil Callender, um, Cambridge resident. Um, I think it's clear that the uh, initiative for dealing with this uh, crisis has to come from within Africa itself and amongst the, uh, the leadership there, both in and out of the government. There's absolutely no substitute for that. Um, I personally, I'm sort of interested in what South Africa is doing about it. I would hope that they would be among the leaders on the continent, and if that's not the case, I think hopefully that will change. But I think from our point of view here, um, one, th one issue that should be on the table uh, front and center um, is, is Africa's debt to uh, foreign banks and um, private lenders. Um, the, the legacy of underdevelopment uh, and the, the, the current economic, world economic situation, which um, is to the detriment of the poor countries terms of trade, et cetera, um, you know, locks uh, these countries into, into indebtedness and poverty. And I, I don't really see, I mean, the perspective for uh, solving this crisis or mitigating its effects are much worse if literally billions of dollars are still flowing out of the continent. So I think any, any real discussion has to include canceling the debt on the continent. And yeah. I would say that would be the principal demand for people outside of Africa to raise in terms of solidarity. As the author of an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal, which mentioned those two things, I'd like to agree with you. Uh, Dr. Zawidi. <laughs> the uh, debt relief is something which has been discussed for a very long time. And it's only uh, a couple of years ago that HIV AIDS and debt relief started to come uh, together. The bank is governed by uh, <laughs> governments who own the bank. So well, the bank can have its policy, and these other governments also could have their policies. But during the G7 meeting recently, they have all come together to make sure that, one, debt relief should be uh, given to all these countries. Two, the resources should be used for HIV AIDS. But there are, there are a number of things we need to put in perspective. One, the money, the debt relief money, is not ready money. Yeah. So this is what we need to fight the HIV AIDS epidemic in Africa today is money which we can put on an emergency basis so that we can mitigate this epidemic. That's one. The second one, unfortunately, governors uh, comes into this. For those governments who have been misusing money, one needs a guarantee that this money from debt relief would be used appropriately. Right. Absolutely. Okay? So there are a number of things which come along with debt relief. However, the, it is on the agenda. In fact, again, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, just when the flood started, I was in Mozambique. The Mozambique government has articulated a strategy for HIV AIDS. It would cost about $50 million per year. And the donor agencies have said, let the government come up at least with 50%. And the Mozambique government was using debt relief 
to, to put up the 50% for this HIV AIDS strategy. So a number of things are uh, in place, but the fundamental issues of governance and corruption and all these things right. have to come to play so that we make a debt. Great. I have one quick comment that Neil started with is, um, uh, I think, well, I totally agree. I think maybe part of the room does with the, the notion that a lot of the problem is racist in, in its basis. Um, but we also have to, I think, carry the, the second concept that Neil brought up is that we can't be also imperialistic. And when we have mm -hmm. the money, even if it's loaned money or debt relief, the agenda has to be determined by um, Africans and African leaders. And the agenda is very simple. We're talking about what are the prevention programs? What are, what are the care issues that are needed? Um, what information uh, and programs do the African countries want in place? It can't come with an outside agenda uh, of, well, we're going to limit it to spending in South Africa. Everyone loves South Africa. Um, we can't come with an agenda of you have to spend the money a certain way or we're going to station more Americans over <laughs> uh, in your country to help teach you how to do this or that. It can't come with an outside agenda. So I think that's um, can I push that Richard can't though? be pushed enough. But well, they, because I think it's a bit more complicated than that for two reasons. And the doctor just referred to it. You've got to tie debt relief and aid to systems of accountability so that when you when you give the money, it doesn't result in new Swiss bank accounts mm -hmm. for African kleptocrats who are trying to imitate Europeans. So, uh, <laughs> in too many cases, in too many cases, and, th and this is very important, right? We have got to have a very dry-eyed, uh, you know, uh, a view mm -hmm. that says that assistance will be connected to uh, uh, systems of accountability to ensure that we don't underwrite more waste and corruption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that has nothing to do with imperialism. Right. And no one should right. be fooled when someone says accountability, and then the response is imperialist aggressor. Well, if that's the case, then the imperialists will keep their money. right? So, mm -hmm. so, so let's not play games with the issue and be real focused that way. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I mean, perhaps just to intervene in an unchairmanly way, but uh, it, it seems right that uh, part of the importance of getting the governance issues right is that if we get the governance issues right, then the governments that speak will be speaking for mm -hmm. African people. Absolutely. And until we get the governance issues right, we don't know that they're speaking for, the Af for African people. They can't be real leaders. Absolutely. So I think these, these are really Absolutely. very much points on the same side. Ma'am. Well, my, my name is Nana. <clears throat> uh, many years ago, I interviewed the, the doctor who was heading the AIDS program in Uganda. And he said uh, there are his own focus is zero grazing in Uganda. And he used the analogy that before, that uh, people could allow their goods to roam everywhere. But now, no more roaming around the village square. Everybody needs to tether the goods close to the house so they cannot roam, roam the countryside anymore. Mm -hmm. And his belief was that condoms are not going to work in Africa because, one, many people can't afford them and they wouldn't know how to use it. They'll probably use the same one over and over again. And I'm just wondering now how, whether much of the success in Uganda can be attributed to the stance that he took that people must take um, a charge of their own lives, you know, the issue of uh, personal responsibility. I just want to know how much that accounts for the success story we hear from Uganda. <clears throat> and speaking about faith-based <clears throat> responses here, I'd just like to let you know that next month we're organizing a meeting. Uh, people from Uganda who are fighting the AIDS epidemic uh, through faith-based organizations, they are going to be speaking at Howard Johnson. If you want to attend, please give me your name and address, and I can send you more information about that. Uh, Reverend Eugene uh, Rivers and uh, the doctor, if you can res respond to the uh, Ugandan case uh, like that. Uh, the, the term zero grazing was actually coined by Pr President Museveni. Uh, what we see in Uganda today is a decrease in new infection in the age group of 15 to 24. The reasons for that are multiple. One, 
The first reason is the first sexual debut has been uh, moved from anywhere uh, from 8 to 10 years to about 16, 18 now, which is, which is substantial. Okay. The second one uh, has been the, the awareness rate with the tools to protect oneself, which is condom use. Uh, at this moment in time, especially in developing countries where the, there is no access to uh, treatment and of course no vaccine in the horizon, the best intervention mechanism we have is the condom. It is protective provided it is used properly and all the time. So that is something we are not uh, preaching promiscuity in young people. There are studies after studies which have shown those young people who have been taught how to protect themselves before they become sexually active and who have access to condoms have, um, uh, have remained, uh, have postponed their first sexual uh, debut to a longer time. So this is, this is what we see very clearly in Uganda today. Uh, can I pick up just quickly? I, I don't want to underscore the doctor's point that what we've really got to talk about is both and and not either or. And I just, as a, the most visible member of the faith community here, <laughs> just want to sort of go on record on that issue, right? That we recognize that there's, there've got to be condoms, there needs to be the massive circulation of condoms uh, among young people. So we're real clear, that's no guarantee or substitute for abstinence, but that's not the claim. The claim is that the fallback strategy is failing abstinence, you gotta have condoms, because biologically you need to stay alive, exactly. regardless of whether, you, you know. So I just wanna, for the record, cause there are some fairly archaic views out of the church community on this. <laughs> and so I just wanna, well, you know, for the record, you know, and so sort of state my position. Yeah. Just, and monogamy, yes, yeah. and monogamy. Uh, um, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna take two more questions. We, we, are, I, we have allowed 15 minutes longer than we originally planned. So take one from here, one from here, if you don't mind, I'd like them just to come and then for the panel to do a final roundup. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Thierry Econ. Uh, I work in the aid industry in this country. I'm actually thinking of going back to Africa at some point to, uh, to do that work there. My, uh, what I have to say are probably more comment. Uh, it was in 86 that President Museveni in Uganda actually identified the issue of aid as one that actually threatened his country development and he was able to convene an international process. That was almost 15 years ago. It took that time. It is scary. It took almost 15 years for the response to actually start to emerge. The World Bank, which you know many times in his history has never hesitated to use political muscle to make African government do what the World Bank want them to do, is now taking a sort of distant approach. Oh no, we have to let the African leaders decide. So I found that to be a bit disturbing. The second piece I found to be disturbing is uh, some of the uh, issues that were raised are talking about the sexually the sexuality of Africans somehow portraying us as sexual beasts with an insatiable appetite for sex. I want to assure you here that Africans don't have more sex than you. Africans do not have more sex than you, I can assure you that. And the issue are really, the issue are really the age structure. We are much younger. Secondly, there's no HIV education. There's no access to condoms. And, the, and there was a final point I wanted to make that I forgot, but we don't have more sex than the Americans. And if you look at, no, no. And if you look at the statistic here, you know, it's, it has been proven that by the age of 14 to 15, kids here engage in sexual behavior. It's about the same in Africa. So I would like this issue to lose the moralistic implication that we have seen over and over and over again in our interaction with the white power structure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll try to keep it brief. My name is Mark Laurie. I've had the great privilege of spending the better part of the last three years working on these issues in Africa. And uh, would like to address uh, the concrete question of what is to be done on the ground to address uh, the needs of the 10 million children who have been orphaned by AIDS right now who are in Africa and in a few other parts of the world, and uh, what can be done to assist the 40 million who have been orphaned by the year 2010. 
Uh, all of our colleagues have made excellent points about the need to mobilize resources uh, through a variety of different mechanisms at international level and on this domestic scene. They are all absolutely correct. But once we assemble those resources, what do we do with them? I've only heard one solution touched on very briefly this evening. It's a solution that disturbs me a bit. I've heard orphanages mentioned a couple of times. Many of you are familiar with these issues may realize the major problems that exist with orphanages. First, with 40 million children who will be orphaned by just 10 years from now, it is physically and financially impossible to build that many orphanages. There's just no way that it can be done, I fear. Um, we need to raise billions, absolutely, to fight this epidemic. But even with those billions, we can't institutionalize a good quarter of the children in most of Africa. And there's another dimension to this as well. And uh, that is that in many contexts, in the US and across Africa, where children have been institutionalized, it's been shown to be profoundly detrimental to their psychosocial well-being, their emotional well-being. They have real problems integrating back into society. A number of these studies are coming out in Ethiopia now with kids who were orphaned in the, uh, the famine of 85. And uh, there's some serious problems with that approach as well. What I'd like to suggest is an alternative that's widely considered to be the state of the art currently and that has potential to be both cost effective, sustainable, and effective in the long term. And that is to strengthen family and community's capacity to care for these children. Yeah. And there are a host of different means of doing so. Um, the two main components of most responses today are first helping communities to forge coalitions of response, bringing together all the different actors within a community and linking them with people at national and international level that can assist them and then microfinance initiatives that provide small loans to caregivers of orphans and uh, that help them to be self-sufficient in the long term. Those, I would suggest to you, are two initiatives to strongly consider supporting in the long term. And uh, it's very compelling to have the option to support orphanages. It's an easy way out, but it's not the best way to use the unfortunately limited resources that we have at our disposal. Thank you. Oh. Oh. On the... Uh, in the um, work that I've been doing on this issue, uh, focusing on the issues of debt relief, uh, uh, vaccines, we have put on the table the issue of behavior, not because Africans are any more or less promiscuous than anybody else. That's, that's not the issue, it's not the question, it's not the point. Uh, what is the point is that we have a crisis which is driven by behavior and no amount of kente cloth rhetoric is going to uh, get us around that fact. So your point's well taken about the moralizing, but let's not be cute and act as though morality or norms or values are not, don't affect human sexuality because that's preposterous. It's, it's, it's obviously not true. Uh, so moralizing is not the thing, to, same thing as talking about morality or norms. And so what we're talking about are developing some normative uh, procedures for addressing the question of human sexuality, not, you know, engaging in saying Africans are more this or that. That's not the issue. In much of the work that's being done, what people are saying is that the issue of sexual responsibility or responsible sexual behavior has to be put on the table with economic uh, maldevelopment, with issues of the vaccine, and so it's not either or. On your, on your orphanage point, uh, you know, I completely agree. It's entirely possible that orphanages may not be the best way to go. So I don't think it's either or. In less than perfect circumstances, that may be the only way to go because it's a less than optimal environment. So your point is well taken. Uh, communities of care need to be supported. Micro lending needs to be supported. Whether or not we can bring it to the scale to meet the need over the next 10 years is equally debatable in your scenario. So uh, at, at, in the last analysis, uh, all of the above need to be tried. Those that are tested and proved more successful should be supported. Let, let me address both uh, this question and the previous one. Thank you. Before you uh, got up, I had written here a word saying don't prescribe. The part of the reason why we failed in fighting this epidemic the last 15 years has been prescriptions. Solutions have been written from Washington, Geneva, New York. If we do that, we will fail again, which brings me back to the bank. The bank is not saying, uh, let's leave it for African governments now. In fact, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that now we are taking a different direction, which is we will be there with what the bank used to do before. But instead of sitting in Washington and writing 
Kenya should have these priorities, we are saying that Kenyans themselves would do, will come up with the priorities and we will follow behind. And that, that is a tremendous change from what the bank used to be before. And um, I, as an African, I'm very proud of this because I used to fight structural adjustment in my other life. <laughs> so I want to make this very, very clear to you. <laughs> the, the orphanage, I'm sorry. Uh, the orphanage issue is you cannot have orphanages for 40 million uh, people, one. Two, there are traditions that we need to utilize, which we have not done for the last 15 years strengthening the extended family. It has been stretched to the limit, but there are excellent examples. There are only pockets. A, a, a colleague of mine calls them boutiques, which show that with a little addition to a family, you can keep the child within a family environment and care for them as well. The bank, to come back, we are trying to do two things with this strategy. One, to strengthen the capacity of these countries. We cannot keep on shuttling technical assistance. This epidemic is here to stay with us and we better build the capacity of countries. Two, to fight the governance and the corruption issue. What's happening now is money sit in the capital cities, but the grassroots, people in the grassroots who care for these orphans don't have access. We are negotiating with government, just like you said, to get the resources directly to the community. So these are the two things that we are trying to do. Okay. Could I make a yeah, modest? Absolutely, yes. I'd like, to, I'd like to finish with a modest suggestion for Dr. Apia. It has to do with the fact that this pandemic is going to be with us for the next number of years. And wouldn't it be wonderful if this could, aspects of this epidemic could be built into the curriculum in the undergraduate level at Harvard, built into the graduate level, and ultimately, and soon, be elevated by the president and the board to the areas of mind and brain where there are five or six overarching subjects that indeed uh, Harvard has suggested it will do that overarch all, all other kinds of issues. The ethical components, the religious components, the economic development components, and all the components are here for a full curriculum. It would be a major statement to your students and to your faculty and to the outside world and to the media that Harvard thought that this was important enough that you could elevate it to such a level. We'll, we'll take that challenge again to the uh, president and provost who are actually on our policy board. And we, we proposed, um, either too late or too many years ago to have AIDS be one of those five overarching themes, um, which it's obviously does affect all the schools and can be in all the curriculums and all the disciplines. Um, but we'll take that challenge and um, propose it again with maybe with some help from some of the panelists here. I should say, I mean, um, it seems the wrong note to end on sounding defensive that, that wasn't about Harvard. But, uh, we, we, <laughs> but it wasn't. We, but it's perfectly fine. But uh, we, we have, in fact, recently started working together on, on a different initiative. Um, and I think that um, just as we've talked about the different range of social actors and institutions that need to uh, be mobilized in dealing with this incredible problem, um, so we need to recognize within the university that it is uh, something that requires a, a, what we nowadays call a multidisciplinary response. Um, we have people here who are thinking a great deal about issues to do with human rights, uh, which is, uh, and um, HIV AIDS. We do have colleagues who work on cultural representations of AIDS in the, in the cultural studies world, in, in the literature departments and so on. And we do have a wide range of people. And I, but I think you're right. What we haven't done sufficiently perhaps is to bring um, in, to integrate this, uh, yeah. and particularly to integrate it more fully into the regular education um, of uh, undergraduates in, in the college, and I accept that as a reasonable challenge. However, I don't want to end with a Harvard point, because it seems to me this, our focus should be, in the end, on two things, on what's going on in Africa and what we can do to help, and I hope you feel that this discussion has been the beginning of a discussion that will allow each of us to go away and find some way uh, of intervening to um, help 
uh, what is uh, an incredible crisis. Thank you all very much for coming. I'd like you to thank the panelists, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.